recording starts. All right. So, four of you did not turn in your Walk to Moons um, chapter review on time. And remember I said no late assignments would be accepted. You either get the points or you don't get the points since we're going over them. So that's something to think about, those of you that didn't get it done on time. So, like I said, we're going to go through these together. That way everyone's on the same page. We know what's happening before we start reading. So, number one, story within a story. What story is being told within the story of the journey that Sal is taking with her grandparents? Would someone like to tell me what story is being told within the story? All right, Logan, I'm picking you. No one raised their hand, so Logan, it's you. Number one. Um, so the story of the the one girl. What was her name? I forgot. Okay, well, what I'm, it's Phoebe, and that concerns me that you don't know. Um, yeah, so Phoebe's story is going to be told within the story. And remember, I talked about that before we even started reading. I said. There's got to be Sal's story, and then she's going to tell Phoebe's story. So there's two stories in this book, Sal's story, and then Phoebe's story is told within it. Next is number two. What evidence shows that Sal is not pleased with Euclid, Ohio? Would anyone like to answer that for me? Remember, she's from Bybanks, Kentucky, and now she's in Euclid, Ohio. Isabella, would you like to tell me how Sal feels about Bybanks or about Euclid, Ohio? She doesn't. <clears throat> she doesn't like it because... She doesn't get the choice of where her dad goes. Right. She doesn't like it. And some evidence would be in the beginning of chapter three, she talked about how tiny the house is, how everything looks the same, how there's no swimming hole. There's no animals. There's no giant tree. It's just, you know, they're tiny little birdhouse houses that everyone just looks like a little birdhouse. It's super small. There's no grass. So far, not loving it. Also, everyone, she said, talks in like those quick, sharp tongues. Um, definitely further down south in Kentucky, people talk slower and stuff. And in Ohio, they're more like us in Indiana. They're going to talk quick. So, so far, not loving it. Would anyone like to tell me what they said for number three? Because number three is an opinion question. It says, do you think Sal could have been happy in any place? This is an opinion question. Olivia, would you like to answer it? Um, I put yes, as long as there, as long as there was a big house and everything that she wanted for the house. All right, so that's a tall order, like Kentucky and put it somewhere else, then she would be happy. So yeah, maybe that way. I don't think Sal would have been really happy anywhere. She didn't want to leave her grandparents. She didn't want to leave the farm. She didn't want to leave where she, you know, her mother once was. Now her mother's not there. And now they're in Ohio in a strange place with this Margaret lady that we don't really know too much about. So I don't know. I feel like she was going to be, she was like dead set on being grumpy no matter where she was. But that was an opinion question. So fabulous. Number four is who is Phoebe? Can anyone tell me who Phoebe is? Landon Rebus, would you like to tell me who Phoebe is? Landon Rebus. No? Landon Rebus. Who's Phoebe? Phoebe is the girl who lives by Salad are both looking for their moms. So Phoebe does not live directly next to Sal. Phoebe lives next to Margaret. Remember when she goes to Margaret's house with her dad, that's when she sees Phoebe. Phoebe is also, well, we don't know anything about, um, we have not officially heard about Phoebe's mom not being there. We only know that from like the back of the book and stuff and from what Sal has said. Um, Cause we're gonna hear about Phoebe's mom and she's gonna be around for quite a while. Um, so anyways, Phoebe's in her class, you know, she doesn't necessarily look like all the other girls. Um, no, Mackenzie, Phoebe's a real person. She's not made up. Phoebe is Margaret's neighbor and she's a girl in her class. Phoebe is not made up. 
All right, number five, describe Graham and Gramps. I'm going to do this one. I think Graham and Gramps are really ornery. They're definitely like old, old, silly people. They really definitely love each other. And we're going to see that even more throughout the book, how much they love each other. They're like, you know, the best little pair, Graham and Gramps. But um, they're definitely getting older. And as people get older, they need more help. So, you know, that's why Sal's going on this lovely adventure with them. Can someone tell me, why does Sal feel a sense of urgency with the trip? Someone tell me, why was she like, you know, hurry, 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 rush, rush, rush. Why is that? Michaela Freeze? Michaela. Michaela. All right, Michaela's apparently isn't working. So she was feeling a sense of urgency because she wanted to get to Idaho by her mother's birthday. And her remember, her mother's birthday is only seven days away. So she was like, oh, snap. Like, we don't have time for every single sightseeing because we have to see she wants to be there by her mom's birthday. Seven, both Sal and her mother have unusual names. What do their names mean? How are they similar? Remember, her mom's real name is Chan Hassan, and her Sal's name is Salamonica Tree Hiddle, and Chan Hassan means sugar maple tree, and Salamonica is a Native American name. And then the tree part was after the sugar maple tree, so both her names have to do with trees, the outdoors, etc. Olivia, do you have a question? Okay. And then finally, what do Sal's grandparents call her? There are two names. Anyone remember what the funny name they call her is? Corgan? Chicka baby. Chicka bitty. Chicka bitty. They call her Chicka bitty, and then they also call her Salamonica. Um, those are the two names they really call her. Not Most people don't really call her Salamonica. Most people just call her Sal, but her grandparents will call her Salamonica. They also call her Chicka bitty. And then number one was just, um, I'm going to go read through your guys' number ones, and you don't have to share them. Um, but it's just, it was talking about a time when you had to pretend you were brave, even though maybe you weren't the most brave. Um, I'll talk about a time one time. One time I was at working at a daycare. I was still in college and I was working at a daycare and it was an afternoon and I was by myself with the kids. And all of a sudden the tornado sirens started going off in town and not like the ones on Saturday where they just practice like there was a tornado spotted, so I had to get all the little baby kids into the basement so we could be safe. And I had to be really brave and not panic, because if I started panicking, the little kids would start panicking. Even though I was really nervous and super, like, not comfortable with the situation, I had to pretend like everything was fine for the little kids. So that would be a time when Mrs. Kneifel had to be brave, even though I was nervous. So I'm excited to go read through your writing activities. And then the last part was just some definitions. There are lots of fun words that we definitely do not say enough and that we need to say more. So there's definitely some good words in this story. The first one is tottery. So she said her tottery grandparents and tottery means like shaky. Remember they're old. So a good word for tottery is like shaky. Okay. An old person, tottery. An old truck, tottery. It's going to be shaky. For caboodle, that was on page one. And caboodle means a crowd. There's a caboodle of people. There's going to be a whole crowd of people. All right. A caboodle, a caboodle of kids, a whole big old crowd. The number nine was extensive. Number nine was extensive, which means wide, broad, far reaching. So if there's an extensive amount of homework, that means a big old bunch of homework. If the field is extensive, that means it's a huge, wide field. You know, it's going on for a long time. Number four is lunatic, which we'll be hearing throughout the story like a million times. Seriously, get ready to hear the word lunatic like every day. We first heard it on page nine. Um, lunatic is an insane person. Dun, 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 dun. All right, lunatic, someone that's insane, okay? And then Heart of Me was on page 11. I put a question mark because I couldn't find it, but then I found it. It's on page 11. And heartedly means exuberantly, vigorously. So if you're doing something wholeheartedly, you're doing it with all your might, super vigorously, okay? 
But then the last one was omnipotent. Um, and that was one that the one girl, you know, with the bob said, you know, she says things like deep brains and omnipotent. So omnipotent was on page 12. And that means almighty, infinite in power. So um, eventually we'll do vocab. Um, We'll have a vocab quiz eventually. So I'll probably take the vocab words as we go and put them on like a running list and materials in reading RTI. Haven't done that yet, but I will. Um, so are there any questions over any of these review questions? Anyone have a question about anything in the story before we continue on? No, 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 no. Okay. So remember, Sal's on a journey with her grandparents, her journey to find her mother. And they are in the car and her parents said, tell, or her grandparents said, entertain us, tell us a story. And she started telling us about Phoebe. We also heard about her mother, how her mother was a Pickford, you know, et cetera. So we are now on page 17. That's what I'm telling you. Okay. On the day that Phoebe sat next to me at lunch and told me I was brave, she invited me to her house for dinner. To be honest, I was relieved that I would not have to eat at Margaret's again. I did not want to see Dad and Margaret smiling at each other. I wanted everything to be like it was. I wanted to be back in Bybanks, Kentucky, in the hills and the trees, near the cows and the chickens and the pigs. I wanted to run down the hill from the barn and through the kitchen door that banged behind me and see my mother and father sitting at the table peeling apples. Phoebe and I walked home from school together. We stopped briefly at my house so that I could call my father at work. Margaret had helped him find a job selling farm machinery. He said it made him happy as a clam at high waters to know I had a new friend. Maybe this really was why he was happy, I thought. Or maybe it was because he could be alone with Margaret Cadaver. Phoebe and I then walked to her house. As we passed Margaret Cadaver's house, a voice called, Sal, Sal, is that you? In the shadows on the porch, Margaret's mother, Mrs. Partridge, sat in a wicker rocker. A thick, gnarled cane with a handle carved in the shape of a cobra's head lay across her knees. Remember, Mrs. Partridge is Mrs. Cadaver's mother, okay? Her purple dress had slipped up over her bony knees that were spread apart, and I hate it, but you could see right up her skirt. Around her neck was a yellow feathered scarf. My boa, she once told me. My most favoritest boa. As we walked, as we started up the walk, Phoebe pulled on my arm. Don't go up there, she said. It's only Mrs. Partridge. I said, come on. Who's that with you, Mrs. Partridge said. What's that on her face? I knew she was going to do it. She did this with me the first time I met her. Phoebe placed her hands on her own round face and felt about, come here, Mrs. Partridge said. She wriggled her crooked little fingers at Phoebe. Mrs. Partridge put her fingers up to Phoebe's face and mashed around gently over her eyelids and down her cheeks, just as I thought. It's two eyes, a nose, and a mouth. Uh, obviously, that's what almost everyone in the world has, two eyes, a nose, and a mouth. Mrs. Partridge laughed, a wicked laugh that sounded as if it were bouncing off jagged rocks. You're 13 years old. Yes, Phoebe said. I knew it, Mrs. Partridge said. I just knew it. She patted her yellow feather boa. This is Phoebe Winterbottom, I said. She lives right next door to you. When we left, Phoebe whispered, I wish you hadn't done that. I wish you hadn't told her I lived next door. Why not? You don't seem to know Mrs. Cadaver and Mrs. Partridge very well. They haven't lived there very long, only a month or so. Don't you think it's remarkable that she guessed your age? I don't see what is remarkable about it. Before I could explain, Phoebe started telling me about the time that she and her mother and father and sister Prudence had gone to the state fair. At one booth, a crowd gathered around a tall, thin man. So, what was he doing, I asked. That's what I'm telling you, Phoebe said. Phoebe had a way of sounding like a grown-up sometimes when she said that, that's what I'm telling you. She sounded like a grown-up talking to a child. What he was doing was guessing people's ages. All around, people were saying, oh, and amazing, and how'd he do that? And he had to guess your correct age within a year or else you want a teddy bear. How did he do, I asked. That's what I'm telling you, Phoebe said. The thin man looked would look someone over carefully, close his eyes, and then he would point his finger at the person and shout, 72, at everyone. He guessed everyone to be 72. Sal, she said. 
That's what I'm trying to tell you. I was just giving an example. He might have said 10 or 30 or 72. It just depended on the person. He was astounding. I really thought it was astounding that Mrs. Partridge could do this, but I didn't say anything. Phoebe's father wanted a thin man to guess his age. My father thinks he looks very young, and he was certain he could fool the man. After studying my father, the thin man closed his eyes, pointed his finger at my father, and shouted, 52! My father gave a little yelp, and all around people were automatically saying, oh, and amazing, and all that. But my father stopped them. Why? Phoebe pulled on one of her yellow curls. I think she wished she hadn't started the story in the first place because he wasn't near 52. He's only 38. Oh, and all day long, my father followed us through the fair, carrying his prize, a large green teddy bear. He was miserable. He kept saying 52, 52. Do I look 52? Does he? I said. Phoebe pulled harder on her hair. No, he does not look 52. He looks 38. She was very defensive about her father. Phoebe's mother was in the kitchen. I'm making blackberry pie, Mrs. Winterbottom said. I hope you like their blackberries. Is there something wrong? Really, if you don't like blackberries, I could. No, I said, I like blackberries very much. I just have some allergies, I think. To blackberries? Mrs. Winterbottom said, no, not to blackberries. The truth is, I do not have allergies. But I could not admit that blackberries remind me of my mother. Mrs. Winterbottom made me and Phoebe sit down at the kitchen table and tell us all about our day. Phoebe told her about Mrs. Partridge guessing her age. She's really remarkable, I said. Phoebe said, it's not that remarkable, Sal. I wouldn't exactly use the word remarkable. But Phoebe, I said, Mrs. Partridge is blind. Both Phoebe and her mother said, blind? So someone tell me why it's remarkable that Mrs. Partridge was able to guess Phoebe's age. Olivia. Because she can't see what um, she looks like. Right. So she heard Phoebe's voice and she touched her face and she was able to guess that she's 13. Like she couldn't see that she looks like a child. She just was able to feel her face and hear her voice and know that she's 13. So that's why Sal thinks it's so cool. Like, oh, snap, she can guess ages and she's blind. She can't even see. And um, Phoebe didn't understand that. She's like, why is that so cool? Like people can guess ages, but then she's like, oh, she's blind. She can't see you. So obviously that's why it's so cool. Later, Phoebe said to me, don't you think that's odd that Mrs. Partridge, who was blind, could see something about me, but I, who can see, was blind about her? And speaking of odd, there's something very odd about that Mrs. Cadaver. Margaret, I said, she scares me half to death, Phoebe said. Why? That's what I'm telling you, she said. First, there is that name, Cadaver. You know what Cadaver means. Anyone know what cadaver means before we, the book tells us? It's a dead body, Marley. You're correct. Dead body. Actually, I did not. It means dead body. Are you sure? I said, of course, I'm sure, Sal. You can check the dic dictionary if you want. But do you know what she does for a living? What her job is? Yes, I was pleased to say. I was pleased to know something. She's a nurse. Exactly, Phoebe said. Would you want a nurse whose name meant dead body? And that hair. Don't you think all that sticking out red hair is spooky? And that voice. It reminds me of dead leaves all blowing around on the ground. This was Phoebe's power. In her world, no one was ordinary. People were either perfect, like her father, or more often they were lunatics or axe murderers. She could convince me of just about anything, especially about Margaret Cadaver. So there are definitely people in the world that you're going to meet, probably have already met, that are really convincing people. Sometimes people just have a way of convincing you of things. So Phoebe is such an intense person, and she's so good at describing things. Sal says, like, no matter what she says, she, like, instantly wants to believe her and wants to be on her side just because she's such a convincing person, Phoebe is. From that day on, Margaret Cadaver's hair did look spooky, and her voice did sound exactly like dead leaves. Somehow, it was easier to deal with Margaret if there were reasons to not like her, and I definitely did not want to like her. Do you want to know an absolute secret, Phoebe said? I did. Promise not to tell? I promised. Maybe I shouldn't, she said. 
your father goes there all over the time. To- all goes over there all the time. He likes her, doesn't he? She twisted her fingers through her curly hair and let those big blue eyes roam over the ceiling. Her name is Mrs. Cadaver, right? Have you ever wondered what happened to Mr. Cadaver? I never thought about it. Well, I think I know, Phoebe said, and it is awful. Purely awful. Oh, snap. So, Phoebe pointed out that her name is Mrs. MRS, which means married. It's not like Miss M-I-S-S, which means not married. So she's like, if her name's Mrs. Cadaver, where the heck is Mr. Cadaver? Well, we don't know. So, Phoebe, convincing person. Phoebe's really an intense person. We have time to read chapter five, so we're going to go on. A damsel in distress. At this point in my story about Phoebe, Graham said, I knew somebody like Phoebe once. PB, I said. Yes, that's right. I knew someone just like PB, only her name was Gloria. Glory lived in the wildest, most pepped up world. A scary one, but oh, scads, more exciting than my own. Gramp said, Gloria, is she the one who told you not to marry me? Is she the one who said I would be ruinish? <laughs> Graham said. Gloria was right about that at last. She elbowed Grams. Besides, Gloria only said that because she wanted you to herself. Golding, Gramps said, pulling into a rest stop along the Ohio Turnpike. I'm tired. I did not want to stop. Rush, 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 whispered the wind and the sky and the clouds, the trees. Rush, rush, rush. If all he wanted to do was take a rest, that seemed safe enough and quick enough for him to do. My grandparents can get in trouble as easily as a fly can land on a watermelon. Two years ago, when they drove to Washington, D.C., they were arrested for stealing the back tires off a senator's car. We had two flats. Spruckled, spuck, sprunkled, spunkled tires, my grandfather explained. We were only borrowing the senator's tires. We were going to return them. And by banks, you could do this. You could borrow someone's back tires and return them later. But you could not do this in Washington, D.C. And you could especially not do it to a senator's car. So this is a good example of Graham and Gramps being like them silly old selves. They're in Washington, D.C. having a great time. And they have two flats. So they see a car with perfectly good tires. And they literally just take the tires off the perfectly good car. Yeah, that's stealing, but apparently in Bybanks, you know, it's a nice tiny town. Everyone knows each other, so they just, you know, they borrow them and they bring them back later. Okay, well, you can't do that in Washington, D.C. Last year, when Graham and Gramps drove to Philadelphia, they were stopped by the police for irresponsible driving. You were driving on the shoulder, a policeman told Gramps. Gramps said, shoulder? I thought it was an extra lane. That's a mighty fine shoulder. So here we were, just a few hours into our trip, out of Louis into our trip out to Lewiston, Idaho, and we were safely stopped in a rest area. Then Gramps noticed a woman leaning over the fender of her car. The woman was peering at her engine and jabbing a white handkerchief on a variously greasy item inside. Excuse me, Gramps said gallantly. I believe I see a damsel in distress, and he marched off to her rescue. A damsel in distress just means like a person that needs help. Specifically, normally we are talking about a woman in distress, meaning she needs help. Yeah, they make Graham and Graham's crazy people. So they're at the rest stop and Graham sees this woman who obviously something's wrong with her car. So he's going to go help her out. Graham sat there patting her knees and singing, Who meets me in the two loves when the two loves do blue? The woman's white handkerchief, now spotted with black grease, dangled from her fingertips as she smiled down at the back of Graham's, who had taken her place leaning over the engine. Might be the car busterator, he said. Or maybe not. He tapped, taped a few poses. Might be these dang snakes, he said. Oh, my, the woman said. Snakes in my engine? Gramps waggled the hose. This here is what I call a snake, he said. Oh, I see. So he said a carbusterator. That's a carburetor. It's something your car needs. I think it does something to do with, like, it not overheating. And then he said snakes, but, like, he's talking about hoses and engines. There's lots of hoses that connect things to other things. And you think those those snakes might be the problem? Maybe so. Grandpa pulled one and it came loose. You see there? He said, it's off. 
Well, yes, but you, dang snake, Scram said, pulling another one. It came loose. Look there, another one. The woman smiled, a thin little worried smile. But two hours later, there was not a single snake still attached to anything to which it was supposed to be attached. The car bus orator lay dismantled on the ground. Various other pieces of the woman's engine scattered here and there. The woman called the mechanic. And once Gramps was satisfied that the mechanic was an honest man who might actually be able to repair her car, we started on a trip again. Salamonica, Graham said, tell us more about Phoebe. Phoebe, I said, Phoebe Winterbottom. Yes, that's right, Graham said, PB. So Mr. Gramps was like, yeah, I'm gonna go help this woman. Was he actually able to help her? No, he like did the opposite of helping her. He like took apart her whole engine and then she still had to call a like mechanic. Like a mechanic could have came in the first place and it probably would have been way smoother and not as big of a deal. So, so silly. And Grams, I don't know if you noticed, instead of saying Phoebe, she keeps on saying PB, like, I don't know, so silly. All right, we're going to stop there for today. You do not have any homework. We will pick up tomorrow. Bye, friends.